Gathas. Uh, so in this presentation, I want to make the link between the wars in the Middle East and the refugee crisis, which I call a displacement or, em or emigration crisis rather than a refugee crisis, because the refugee crisis in Europe is actually a very small part of what's happening in the countries at war. I'm going to do, deal with it in three parts. One is to do with the understanding of the wars. The second is to do with the, uh, the nature of the displacement or immigration crisis, particularly from the three countries that dominate the refugee population, Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And then to talk about the responsibility of Europeans, because unless there is a proper understanding of the nature of the crisis, the displacement, the immigration crisis, I don't really think that uh, Europeans in particular can take responsibility for what's going on. I mentioned I was coming to this conference in Syria earlier this year to the Mufti of uh, the religious leader of Syria, and he said this, I want to send this message. Please send a message to Europe on my behalf. Tell them to stop the war on Syria. The refugees will stop within one day. Within one month they will return. Those most responsible are Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Israel and the USA. Now, a similar type of message comes from the Archbishop, uh, Christian Archbishop of Aleppo and the uh, legal scholar, US legal scholar Francis Boyle, who says all these refugees are fleeing because the United States government has been destroying their states, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Somalia, Yemen and Libya. It's not spoken about very much in the Western media because the wartime censorship of the stories about these war are to, to refer to them as civil wars, internal sectarian conflicts, and to downplay strongly the involvement of the European states, in particular the NATO states. There are some myths, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. A lot of them are spelled out in my book, The Dirty War on Syria, uh, which I have some copies of. Whoops. Working our sponsors. <laughs> um, but briefly I'll touch on this, these concepts. The idea that there's a civil war in Syria, the idea that the Syrian government has been killing its own people for the last five years, that somehow remains popular in Syria, and the idea that Syrian refugees are fleeing the regime. Uh, it's pretty much broadly agreed across the board, even with all the, the polemics going on, that most of the refugees do want to go home. Um, the question is what sort of conditions are they going to go home to? So these are just anecdotal uh, expressions here, but it gives us some idea that people don't really want to leave their homes unless they have to. And it's pretty clear also that they're fleeing the war, but there are manipulations in the European media and European NGOs. Um, this one from a group called the Syria Campaign, which is created in Wall Street, um, and it has funding from US foundations and so on, to say that Syrian refugees are fleeing Assad. They actually did a, uh, an opinion poll in Germany. Uh, they surveyed about 890 Syrian refugees there, and they produced these figures. One of them, one of them was said that most of them want to go home. Uh, but the other one was to say that 70% of the refugees are fleeing Assad. Now this fits the wartime propaganda, but there's something very wrong with it, and you don't have to look very far to see what's wrong with it. If you look at the demographics of the people they surveyed, uh, they are three times overrepresented young men, and three quarters are from the areas occupied by jihadists. So the UNHCR figures on the demographics are that it's pretty much gender equity when you look at several million Syrians, so men and women, and so on. There's, from this survey, 88% men between 16 and 35. And the UNHCR data is 50% between 18 and 59. So there's a huge overrepresentation of young men. Whether that reflects on who's getting asylum in Germany, I'm not sure. My base point here is the UNHCR data. The selection of the, of the people for this survey was done by a partisan group which is committed to overthrowing the Syrian government, to supporting uh, NATO country intervention in Syria. And you see that overrepresentation, including from the areas they came from. Leading questions were put to put it in context, the asylum seekers in Europe generally, apart from the ones that they selected in Germany, are about 3% of the displaced people in the, overall, uh, in the overall population of displaced people. There's some other things on polls. I have something in the book about the nature of the polls. Most of the Western polls done on Syria in recent years have been specifically aimed at trying to ascertain some sort of support from Syrian people for Western intervention. That's been the objective of most of them. Well, the, 
without suggesting that the that we should understand the war by looking at one side, it's been. Uh, I think we have to read all sides of, and read. If you're a researcher, you have to read all sides of what's going on. But the nature of the war, I, I suggest, can be understood. Um, the main elements can be understood from Western sources. That is to say, there's a great bias in looking at the Syrian media, the Iranian media, the Russian media, and so on. Um, and I think it's important that we do look at both sides there. But to determine the main features of the crisis, I believe that we can look at the Western sources. And admissions. This is something you do in normal legal process. You look for independent evidence, if it exists, or admissions on the part of, on the, part of the active players. Um, looking at the evidence, um, I suggest we can see that the war in Syria in particular was a salafist insurrection backed by Western powers and their, uh, and their allies, in particular Saudi Arabia. The Saudis have admitted arming the insurrection in Dara in March 2011, for example. But the war went in two phases. First of all, there was this idea of a humanitarian intervention, um, with the idea that the, the Syrian president, the army, were killing their own people. And then the second phase, which was a reactivation of the war on terror, that the European powers had to be in Iraq and Syria to fight terrorist groups, basically. So we could call that protective intervention. And the same thing happened in Iraq as happened in Syria, or happened in Syria as happened in Iraq. We know that ISIS, for example, was created in Iraq 10 years ago before the Syrian conflict. So there's some of the evidence. I'm not going to go over this in detail. I want to skip through it just to say that, that it's documented in the book. The Saudis armed the Islamist insurrection in Dara in March 2011. Uh, Al Jazeera spearheaded the propaganda war that was going on. Those partisan sources are still being used. Not in Libya, by the way, because after the Libyan conflict, there is now some sort of uh, judicious sort of interpretation. You look at even conservative US journals are admitting now, looking at the evidence that the claims against Gaddafi were false. They don't do that about Syria because the conflict is on, ongoing and it still means something to the powers, basically. If you look at all of the US intelligence docu documents that have come out since then, you can see um, the admissions of from their part. For example, in 2012, before ISIS came into Syria, the US was saying uh, this, uh, the insurrection, the violence, the armed groups were dominated by Al-Qaeda in Iraq and the Salafist groups in the Muslim Brotherhood. This is at a time when publicly they're saying this is a, a secular uprising and so on. And they said the possibility of establishing a Salafist state in eastern Syria, an Islamic state, was exactly what the Western powers wanted. This is what the intelligence is saying in uh, August 2012. Well. So there have been two big narratives there. I won't go through this again, but part of the point of this book was to document some of the, the major claims about massacres. There were, have been a large number of civilian massacres in Syria. Most of them, when you examine them, were committed by the Islamists and then blamed on the government. Um, so the Hula massacre in 2012, for example, uh, in that case, uh, the problem was compounded by the fact that there were two UN committees investigating that. The first one had conflicting information. The, the first one that was based in Syria, um, that was disbanded. Another one co-chaired by a US diplomat blamed it on the government. But as I document in the book, there were 15 independent witnesses naming particular people um, and particular groups that were involved in that massacre, which led to the downgrading of diplomatic relations of most countries with Syria. Something I notice is now attempting to be reversed by a number of the Western countries because what they're doing is they're going to Damascus, have been going to Damascus for about two years to try and reactivate a security relationship with Damascus while still opposing Damascus politically. The chemical weapons attack also, a whole chapter is devoted to that. A lot of independent evidence disproved the claims against the Syrian government back there, but before and after that attack there have been many incidences of the, the Islamist groups committing those using, using chemical weapons. Um, this one, the attack on Aleppo University in January 2013, replicated yesterday or the day before on Aleppo University. Uh, Aleppo University dormitories were attacked by the same groups, the remnants of the Free Syrian Army, Arar Sham and Jaish al-Islam, associated with Jabhat al-Nusra, the official al-Qaeda in, in Syria. They put out this little document in early 2013, uh, telling families not to send their children to the university until the regime falls. You notice, by the way, uh, sorry, this is a different one. This is from Fallujah. Um, they've got a document that looks, looks much the same. But in Fallujah, ISIS in Fallujah are saying the same sort of thing. To wear similar outfits to the, the militia, which they say are mainly Shia militia in, in 
Iraq and get them to kill prisoners, blame it on the, blame it on the militia. That's the Hua massacre and the documentation I made of it with the, the people there, by the way, killed were people that had either supported the government or had participated in the elections of early 2012. It didn't matter what sect they were. The Islamist groups talked about, you know, the Sunni people and the Shia people, but this was, in this case, many Sunni people were killed also because they participated in the elections and their families. The chemical weapons incident. All of the independent evidence shows that the claims against the Syrian government fabrications there. Why does that matter? It matters because these continuous uh, assertions were used as an attempt to gain greater Western intervention there, to prolong the war, to, uh, for example, give an incentive to those groups to commit massacres again and blame it on the Syrian government because the Western media would uncritically report it. And indeed, they've done it mostly to this day. In particular, the liberal media, interestingly, this type of war, as opposed to an Iraq-style invasion, appeals to Western liberalism in many respects. Here's a humanitarian crisis. We have to intervene and save these people. It's been very slow to percolate through Western minds this type of manoeuvre because there's something in the Western mind and it cuts across left and right that suggests the idea of saving people from their own government is actually some great uh, uh, cause. The protective intervention was the extension of the idea of the war on terror that the US and now we know special forces from France, Germany um, also are in Syria now. Um, with the idea of trying to get some leverage really in the final political outcome in that war there because they, they worry, the Saudis and Israel in particular worry that the war is going to end with the defeat of ISIS by the Syrian army and its allies, the Hezbollah, Iran, Russia, some of the regional militias and uh, they're going to lose any influence in that outcome there. So the special forces are there to try and have some influence for example in the Kurds in the northern part of Syria which is doubtful because the, the Syrian Kurds, unlike the Iraqi Kurds, or the leadership of the Iraqi Kurds, are getting most of their weapons from the Syrian army on the basis that they're defending themselves. And so that's why there's such a lot of uh, special forces on the ground in northeastern Syria at the moment. It's not a new thing to provoke a danger, intervene, claiming to be a protector of that same danger. Jose Marti, the Cuban uh, nationalist hero, said that in the late 19th century, that before the American-Spanish War, um, he predicted such a thing, that the US was going to use an incident to intervene in that war and take over the country. But we know that ISIS, originally called ISI, or Al-Qaeda in Iraq, was created in Iraq in 2006 in an attempt to get uh, prevent Baghdad getting close to Tehran. Now, that was revealed in a, an important article by Seymour Hersh in 2007 called The Redirection of the Bush Administration. Um, it saw that its intervention against Saddam Hussein would inevitably push uh, a better relations between Iraq and Iran. Remember they'd funded a war between Iraq and Iran throughout the 80s to try and weaken both countries and they didn't want that closeness. It's failed of course because Baghdad and Tehran actually are quite close these days. How do we know that the US is at least indirectly, if not directly, supporting ISIS because the major, Syri the major US officials have admitted it to us? Uh, the Vice President Biden, the head of the Armed Forces, General Martin Dempsey, the head of the Senate the Congressional um, Committee on the Armed Forces, uh, Lindsey Graham, have admitted that their close allies, that is to say Turkey, Qatar and Saudi Arabia, are funding all of those Islamist groups to overthrow the Damascus government. The Hillary Clinton emails confirm this. You know? So there's a lot of admissions, even if you didn't read the Iraqi press. If you've been reading the Iraqi press for the last two years, you'd say they are citing a lot of cases of the US directly supporting ISIS. But if you don't want to read the Iraqi press, you go to the US officials and, and take the US officials' um, admissions on that part. Of course, the problem there is they're claiming that there's a they're claiming that there's a distance between what the Saudis do with US weapons and what the US does. So the moderate rebels, I'll, I'll pass on over that. Now on to the refugee implications for this. The implications I mentioned before that. The displacement of people with these wars in those three countries which formed the, the two, the three greatest parts of the people that came into this island, um, although that seems to have changed now, I don't know what the composition of the refugees in the camps is in now, but um, from those three countries, all of whom had interventions involving European and NATO powers basically. 
the asylum seekers here are a relatively small proportion of that let's, let's recognise to start with. And most of those displaced people are being dealt with either inside the country, in the case of Syria for example. Syria, surprisingly enough, still has the largest group of displaced people from Iraq, about 400,000. It was 2 million several years ago. But even during the conflict, um, the largest group of displaced Iraqis are still in Syria. Um, this was last year, um, just showing that the Syria, Afghanistan and Iraq were dominating in, in early, early this year and, and last year, the arrivals. There were a couple of events in the war that you can correlate to that surge in arrivals. I don't think it's the whole story, really. I think something is going on in Turkey that I don't fully understand, I have to admit. There's some role of the Erdogan government in how those refugees came in such sharp surges there, but there were two, of war, two war events in that year. One was the invasion of Italy in northern Syria by the, the Army of Conquest, which was a coalition of Jabhat al-Nusra al-Qaeda and the other, uh, what do you say, the, the children of the Free Syrian Army that coalesced in Ar al-Sham and Jaish al-Islam, for example. In April last year, they took over um, most of Italy in that time, and therefore a lot of people in Italy were going into Turkey at that time. The invasion of Palmyra by ISIS, I don't believe, had such a big impact on it, but the attack by the Turkish government on the Kurds in southern Turkey was also a little bit later in July and summer, also would have had an influence on that. But something else is going on in Turkey which needs to be added into that equation there. But by the time the Russians got involved, that spike was going down. The Russians' air power got involved in Syria. There is a counter-movement going on which sort of goes to this idea that, well, if you do, in fact, get security in some of those areas, if you stop the war in certain areas in Syria, people are going to go back. There's been quite a lot of reports. Uh, Erdogan claimed that a lot of refugees would be held in a safe zone before the great surge of refugees <coughs> came across here. That didn't work. Um, some Syrians have said that the half the population has been displaced at different times, but from late last year, when some of the villages were being reclaimed in northern Syria, there have been significant returns. They say several thousand returned from Jordan in the south. They're still fighting in Dara there, but because the aid was so catastrophic in Jordan, some of them are going back into Dara, for example. 94,000 were said to have returned from Turkey, half to Kobani. 140,000 left Lebanon in 2015, a lot of them going to Homs, which was pretty much secured by the government um, some time back. Um, there's video of, of displaced Syrian families returning home in Damascus when some of those areas were secured. Uh, most of Damascus, by the way, is now secured. I was in Damascus in April, and uh, in April there'd been no bombings of Damascus for 40 days, and I believe hardly any since then. That's a big change from several years of bombing by US-backed armed groups in the eastern countryside of Damascus, and to some extent in the south. Um, rural Hama, earlier this year, dozens of families uh, filmed going back. Uh, so there's a series of, there's been a claim that 1.7 million displaced citizens were returning to their areas in Hama, Idlib and southern Aleppo. Of course the big fighting is still going on in Aleppo there. 